So this, I know it took him uh, about 45 minutes to an hour, but this is all that Mel said uh, as far as I'm concerned, right? So your Hamiltonian has these three pieces, kinetic, electron-electron repulsion, and the one-body piece. We're going to define F as a functional of the density to minimize these pieces over all possible wave functions yielding the density that you have. And that minimum, I think you forgot to mention, is overall normalized anti-symmetric wave function. Uh, and then, normalized <laughs> unit. Correct, normalized unit. Um, and then the ground state energy, if you knew that, could be gotten from this principle here, right? That you minimize this F overall densities. And this is a much uh, simpler search. You're only searching over densities, not uh, wave functions. And if only you knew TIF. And I'm going to add one more line to that before I start the cone sham equations, which is that if you want to find that minimum, you learn to do the Euler equation, which is that the functional derivative of f with respect to the density, uh, I'll use r's for vectors plus v of r equals zero. Uh, when we, we differentiate this guy, we differentiate that guy, and now I haven't written in anything like a chemical potential because if we keep the number of particles fixed, then the constant in this, in this minimization is arbitrary. So I just choose it to be zero. So, and that is how you find the F. And in the old Thomas Fermi theory, they write down an approximation for F, and then they solve this equation. And so, uh, this is going to be a functional of the density, and only uh, if you have the exact F, only the exact ground state density will satisfy this equation. So you put in different densities and only one will give you exactly the potential that you started with and that's how you find it. Then you go backwards and you take that, the, the solution to that and feed it in here to get the ground state energy. Uh, and doing this functional derivative, you can think of it roughly like doing a derivative over a multi, uh, a, a, multi uh, a function of many variables. Uh, it's not quite the same, but it's close. Okay, so that's that's all uh, in the sort of homework cone theorem and the constrained search formulation. Uh, now what we're going to do is the cone sham equations, which came the next year. And these are what are actually used in practice for uh, almost all modern applications. And to, to, well, in a certain sense, you almost don't derive them, you postulate them. So you imagine fictitious, fictitious non-interacting electrons with the same density, the ground state density, as the real system. And in a sense, that's, that's it. That's all, almost everything, right? Everything that fo now follows is, is just falls from that starting point. Uh, so if you have, if, if they're not interacting electrons, then they will satisfy a non-interacting Schrodinger equation. Sorry, it's a mind. Uh, but they're still electrons. They still satisfy the Pauli principle. So you occupy them in order, and their density will be sum of the lowest, uh, sum of the squares of the lowest 
uh, both cone jam orbitals up to n. Uh, and well, you, you define this system so that its density is the same ground state density as the original system, assuming it exists. Now, the most important part here is going to be identifying what this cone sham potential is and uh, how we're going to do that is we're going to use the Euler equation uh, and we're going to apply the Euler equation to our non-interacting electrons. So we're going to write that the kinetic energy of these electrons squared. Uh, so that's their kinetic energy. You just uh, differentiate them, take the square, integrate it, divide by two. Uh, we put an S to indicate something that's been calculated on the cone sham system, not on the real system. Uh, and then we're going to write F as a TS part plus some correction which will turn out to be a familiar object, uh, but for now we just call it EHXC. And then we say, well, the, the cone sham electrons that satisfy this cone sham equation uh, must, sol uh, must be solving the corresponding Euler equation. So, um, When we break it down this way, and we know also that that, that they satisfy their Euler equation, we see that uh, this guy is minus V of R. Uh, and this guy is minus Bs of R, so this tells us this implies minus Bs of R plus, we'll call it Vhxc of R equals minus V of R or Bs of R minus V of R plus Vhxc of R. VHXC of R is the functional derivative of what will turn out to be the Hartree exchange correlation energy. So, Leah, let me write it in, in the most familiar form where we'll define Hartree energy. So, I'll call it U. So, the Hartree energy is the classical electrostatic self-energy of this charge density. So that's not the electron-electron repulsion, that's uh, sort of a, in the classical electromagnetic sense, uh, a crude approximation to it. Uh, and then its potential, so if you functionally differentiate that guy, uh, you get No, almost any DFT book has an appendix at the back explaining how to do functional derivatives. Uh, so we almost always separate this piece out. So we write EHXC as equal to U plus EXC. And this is called the exchange correlation energy for reasons we'll get to. And then we get the famous result that the cone sham potential is 
the original potential, the heart rate piece, and the exchange correlation piece. And what's vital about this is, so these guys are functionals, this guy a, and this guy are functionals of the density. What it tells you is, if, if you know EHXC, e EXC as a functional of N, and can differentiate and the cone sham equations are um, a self-consistent set that uh, can be solved uh, to get prediction of uh, ground state E and N. So this closes the equations. So just that one piece of knowledge, right, uh, gives you this self-consistent set of equations. Vs is a functional of n, and so you make a guess for the density, solve your cone sham equations, it gives you a new density. Usually you mix in the sum of the new density with the old density and solve them again. And you do it again and again until it stops changing, and you get uh, a prediction for the ground state energy and density. Now in the special case, where you use the exact object, the exact exchange correlation energy, which you define by this difference, right? So we've written it here. Let's write it down. So we have F. So Mel showed us how to define F using the constrained search. So F is TS plus U plus EXT. So you can, we use that as the definition of the exchange correlation energy, right? It's the difference between the exact kinetic energy and the exact electron-electron repulsion minus TS minus U. Yeah. U plus EXT. I just wanted to show that Well, uh, yes, just for shorthand, so that was the heart tree and the exchange no, correlation. No, but I yeah. want to make sure that everyone is H, that was a U, which used to match the same expression. Questions? Uh, so I missed the step where you related the, um, the single, the non interacting kinetic energy with the, um, the react, the interacting kinetic energy. I didn't, okay. right? I said I have a set of orbitals, right? And I know how to write down their kinetic energy. So that was my definition of the non-interacting kinetic energy. Uh, and then I simply wrote F, I, 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 since I know the kinetic energy of my home sham electrons, and it turns out, we'll see, it's a big part of F, uh, I'm going to just write F as that part plus a correction. Well, I guess in your exchange correlation, then you, you have the, the, the added component of your interacting kinetic energy. But I just didn't I didn't see that in the equations. Uh, that, so that's in that's in F, right? Right. So EXC has that built into it by definition, right? And we'll see. We'll pull it out a little bit. Uh, so, but it's all it's it's all in there, right? So I, I have I've done nothing with the many body problem except rearrange the furniture, as it were. Right? I've simply taken what we had from Mel's lecture and said if I have a fake set of electrons that have the same density, uh, can I go backwards, solve them, and uh, and it turns out all I need to know is this little piece of the energy. So what if the first, I mean, so what if there is no fictitious non-interacting system whose ground state density is the same as the... Uh, 
So I was going to then list some of the things, the points about this, and I've assumed that that exists when I did this. Uh, there are certainly densities you can write down where uh, this, the, this potential, for example, is ill-behaved and you would say that it doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean that the density of any many-body problem has that feature. So, so I've assumed what we call uh, non-interacting V representability. As, as a practical matter, most of the time, uh, it's very rare that you run into actual cases where something is not, uh, does not have a common channel potential. But there are, we know of cases, we can construct cases on purpose where it doesn't exist, where it is a little badly behaved. Okay. Uh, good. So now, uh, so let's see, one of the things, so I'm going to use as an example of real numbers, the neon atom, and we'll immediately see some of the advantages of the phone sham system, uh, while you're thinking about things. So if I look at T, V, E, and V, T is 128.94 heart rates. VE is 53.24, and the one, the external potential is minus 312. This is all in heart rates. So these are large numbers, right? Uh, there's 27 electron volts in a heart rate, so these are uh, tens of thousands of electron volts. So the, the electronic energies are very large themselves. Uh, what really matters is energy differences, like the difference between a molecule and the separated atoms, or maybe the difference between an atom and its ion, and they tend to be a lot smaller. So these are these energies, and this TS is the cone sham kinetic energy. Uh, it's going to turn out to be 128.61. So it's very close to the true kinetic energy. So, uh, so what that tells you is that since you're only going to approximate this part, you're going to be approximating a, a much smaller energy. Uh, well, let's say U. U is 66.06 and EXC turns out to be minus 12.98. So in, in the old Thomas Fermi theory, you make approximations for these guys as functionals of the density. Uh, so that's almost 200 heart trees. Here you're going to approximate 13 heart, uh, heart trees. So by writing things this way, you have to make approximations for a much smaller amount of the energy. So this is why Typically, one of the ways of thinking about why cone sham calculations tended to be much more accurate than Thomas Fermi calculations. Because you're not trying to approximate all of that, you're just trying to approximate a small-ish fraction of it. So now let's look a little bit at the small fraction. Uh, well, so we'll define a couple of things. Let's see. So we'll define uh, phi of n to be the, the cold sham wave function for density n. And we'll say psi of n is equal to the many body wave function for density n. And right here we'll assume, assume uh, always 
uh, phi is a single is a single Slater determinant. Cone-Cham orbitals. You don't have to do that, but it will ma it makes uh, some of the math simpler, uh, and it is the typical case. So uh, then, then we can say that our kinetic energy is just the kinetic operator acting on this many-body wave function, right? That will be, give me the same answer. When I feed in a single Slater determinant, if phi is a single Slater determinant, then I will just get what I wrote before as this pops right out. Uh, of, of just putting in uh, a Slater determinant there. You can just get the kinetic energy of the orbitals. Okay. And then we can also ask, what is the expectation value of VEE? So the electron-electron repulsion, let's get its expectation value on the cone-sham wave function. And now in this case, because this is a two-body operator, uh, you get two contributions, and these are uh, fermions. You get a what's called a direct piece, uh, which turns out to be nothing other than the Hartree, plus uh, what's called the exchange piece. Uh, and the exchange, I'll write it out. Uh, is when you evaluate the two-body operator for fermions, there's a piece where you swap the indices uh, that survives, and it's just so just over the occupied orbitals. Uh, Now, in cone, cha in, in, in cone cham density functional theory, we define EX on the cone cham orbitals, which is slightly different from traditional quantum chemistry, where it would be defined on the hartree fock orbitals. And I don't know, Whitehead later is, is talking about OEP, and I think that will come up a little bit. In, in practice, these energies tend to be very, very similar. Okay, so this is the exchange energy, and then what's left, the last little piece of difference is called the correlation energy, and we can write the correlation energy EC as just the difference between the Hamiltonian for a given, let's do it as a density functional for a given density, is the Hamiltonian on the many-body wave function minus the Hamiltonian on the cone sham wave function. And if we follow the pieces that we have, this is just going to be T plus VEE plus a one-body piece, but the one-body piece is going to be the same because, uh, because the densities are apparent are defined to be the same. And then this thing here is going to be minus u minus ex, uh, oh, minus ts, minus u minus ex. That's the kinetic piece. This is the electron-electron repulsion. And so we can group those pieces. Like right, 
this, and this, and this is called TC, and this is called UC. So this is a kinetic piece, we call it kinetic correlation, and potential correlation. So we see explicitly that there's two contributions to the correlation energy. One from the difference in the kinetic energies and one from this difference in potential energies. And the correlation energy is much smaller than... Yep. Uh, I have a question. Which Hamiltonian are you using for both of them? Is that that's the full many body that's the full many body wave? Um, Sorry, which what? The two Hamiltonians here. So th this is the many body wave function and this is the cone chan wave function. Okay, but what is the Hamiltonian using? The same one for both? Yes. It's the it's the Hamiltonian of the yes, T plus B, E E plus B. Right? And so here you see that it explicitly that the correlation energy is always negative. From the, from the variational principle, since this guy minimizes the energy of this Hamiltonian, this guy can't. It's a different wave function. So at, at best, if he's the same one, you get zero, otherwise it's negative. So if you define these things in the sequence that I did, you can deduce lots of simple properties of them, right? Uh, you can see, uh, well, you see explicitly that U is always positive because it's a positive uh, integral, and then uh, you can show that the exchange is always negative. And let's, let's look at this piece here. I need a here. Let's look at the... These are the, this is the breakdown of the exchange correlation energy. So we see that typically most of the exchange correlation energy is exchange. And only a very small amount is correlation. And you can prove that TC is always positive, and then UC is always negative and more negative than TC, so EC is always negative. And interestingly, for a weakly correlated system, TC is usually uh, roughly equal to minus EC, uh, but not quite as large. Uh, and you can prove that too. So, uh, so the correlation energy is a very small fraction of the total, right? So the total energy uh, is actually minus 128.94 for an atom. There's a virial theorem. And then the correlation energy is less than 1% here, less than half a percent of that. However, right, the correlation energy is terribly important. And the way you know that is, so long before DFT became popular, lots of chemists would solve the Hartree-Fock equations. And although they're very good for giving you some sense of how chemistry works, the the energy differences in Hartree-Fock are typically really bad. Uh, you really can't do energetically meaningful quantum chemistry with Hartree-Fock most of the time. Uh, and the only difference between that uh, and, and, and what we're looking at here is the correlation energy, right? So even though that correlation energy is very small, it's vital. It's sort of so when you look at an energy difference, for example, when you break a bond, about something like half the dissociation, the, the, the change in the, exchange in the exchange correlation energy might be something like the same as about half the bond dissociation energy. Because a lot of the big energies don't change much at all. 
So, well, I have neon here, but if I had nitrogen, the numbers would be similar, right? But a lot of the kinetic energy and all those other energies are in the core. And that isn't going to change when you break the bond at all. So it's much, so the, ex the exchange and correlation play a big role when you do energy differences. Within this swap, the correlation energy is defined as the difference between the exact energy and the energy. Yes. Is it the same term as this? So, so it's almost but not quite. So, so since this is defined on the cone sham orbitals of a given density, in hartree fock you minimize over all possible orbitals. So you get to a slightly, very, very slightly lower energy uh, in hartree fock theory. But, but the, numerically it's almost identical to <coughs> this definition. Physically, does they relate to other? This will come up throughout the week. Uh, so for lots of ground state properties, it hardly matters. But once you look at anything outside the ground state, it matters a lot because the gap in a hard to calculation is much larger typically than a cone jam gap. So, so, the, so the, diff the crucial difference is that the orbitals are all from a single multiplicative potential in cone jam. Whereas you have, uh, since you're, you allow the orbitals to be free, the, the potential in a hartree fock calculation depends on the orbital. That doesn't happen in common channel. More questions? Yes. Yep. How would you get to assume that time is it is, it is typically a single Slater determinant, but it isn't always a single Slater determinant. Uh, because you can arrange cases uh, where it isn't, and I guess, it, so if I, so when, well, so certainly typically for weakly correlated systems it is, but if I take the four, four electron ion series. So I'm starting with beryllium and I increase Z. By the time I get to somewhere about 28, I think the number is, uh, you find that if you look at the exact many body density for Z equals 28 but only four electrons, uh, that the, the minimizing uh, wave function for that density is, is, is a combination of four Slater determinants. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is that the gap between the 2s and the 2p has become very small and it turns out that mixing in some of the 2p minimize, uh, makes the kinetic energy lower. But again, that isn't a calculation that many people do in practice, right? Uh, that's, I think, perhaps the most physical one I know of. Uh, but that does happen and it's been Verified. Exactly. So then there's a sort of difference between the interacting and the non-interacting systems. And there are lots of uh, interesting papers that people have studied these cases. But again, in practice, they don't come up so much. Okay. So, uh, so, and now we see again. Right, the beauty of this cone jam scheme where the, the numbers you're going to approximate, so you're only going to make an approximation for the exchange correlation energy. Um, and that's what's going on in, in those in most of those 30,000 papers. Okay, uh, so a few more things. Now, Chairman, when did I start? I think I started about 11, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I started at 10.36, right, so, so what does that count? So you have until 11. 11.15. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the program? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so 11.21. Uh, that's, that's an exchange correlation correction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a bit more. So, so this cone sham potential. Uh, so you can define it exactly. 
Uh, so the exact cone channel potential. Now, so if I take the helium atom, this is the one I always show, uh, and I'll make a cut through it. And the, the true one body potential is minus two over R in atomic units, right? Uh, that's the external potential, two for Z equals two, and one over R for Coulomb attraction. Now my friend uh, Cyrus Umergar and Xavier Gunn solve exactly the, uh, the many body problem for a helium atom with quantum Monte Carlo, and they, well, Actually, it turns out that the helium atom is symmetric around the origin. It's just my drawing that looks bad, right? Uh, so they get the exact density, uh, exact kind of R. Of course, it's numerical, so but it's just more, much more accurate than anything that's typical DFT calculation will give you. And then it turns out in two lines, you can deduce the formula for the exact cone sham potential. So I'm drawing it with the dashed line. So this is Vs of R. And what does that mean? It means that if I put, I take the 1s orbital of this potential here, and I doubly occupy it. So this 1s orbital is at minus 0 0.9, I think it's 0 0.3 Hartree's. And I put two electrons into that 1s orbital, non-interacting electrons, I get exactly that density. And it's, it's, it's just all you have to do is write down the non-interacting Schrodinger equation in reverse, given the density, and ask what potential for a single doubly occupied orbital gives you that density, and it's a little differential equation. And you can solve it, and you get the exact cone sham potential for the helium atom. And I doubly occupy that guy and I get the exact density. So if you want to make your head hurt a little, and it's not so early in the morning anymore, you can ask yourself, one of my favorite questions uh, is uh, ask yourself, well, does the cone sham wave is the cone sham wave function correlated or not? And the answer is yes. Because if you think of the cone sham system, right, these are non-interacting electrons, and the cone sham wave function is just the doubly occupied lowest orbital. So that's clearly not correlated. On the other hand, that cone sham wave function, if we think about where it came from, since it gives you the exact ground state density of the interacting helium problem, has all the correlation, all the many-body correlation of the ground state of this many-body problem. Both statements are true. Right? And this is part of the subtleties of DFT. Right? You have to keep both uh, in mind. Right? Okay, so a few more. Hardy doesn't believe me, so he's left the room. Important points. Well, uh, so the behavior of the cone sham potential. One of the crucial things that will come up over and over again. So you can prove. Of the exact density decays as a constant times the power of R times an exponential. Uh, and alpha here is equal to the square root of two times the ionization potential. So I is equal to the ionization potential. So this is E of n minus 1 minus D of n for your system. 
So if you take a finite system and look as r goes to infinity, this is how the density decays. Now, since this is how the exact density decays, this is also how the density in the cold charm system decays, because by definition it's the same. So if you have non-interacting particles, electrons, well, when you go out very far, they'll be dominated by the highest occupied orbital. So the same statement is going to be that alpha is going to be root twice the ionization energy of non-interacting electrons. But that's just going to be twice the homo eigenvalue. Because the difference between n and n minus 1 is going to be just the eigenvalue of the highest occupied one. So we find that the ionization potential, that f, let me write this way, epsilon homo, is equal to minus i. Uh, and they, and this, this, so this is true for the exact cone sham system. Most of the approximations, not quite all, uh, violate this quite badly. Uh, and, and we'll see why, when it's important and when it isn't. Uh, but, but the exact cone sham potential satisfies this condition. Okay. One special case that's worth checking out always is the case of one electron. So one electron, it turns out, is not such a difficult many-body problem to solve because there's only one electron. Well, one electron, uh, EX is going to be exactly minus U and EC will be exactly zero. Uh, you can check if you put in just one orbital in here, you get to exactly minus the hard free energy and therefore the correlation must be zero. And you know that uh, because uh, VEE -E is equal to zero, right? There is no electron-electron interaction if there's only one electron. So then, uh, from this condition, right, so uh, for large R, Again, if we go out to very large distances in the cone sham system, you'll be dominated by the highest occupied molecular orbital. There's only one of them. So Vx will go like uh, minus the Hartree, so that's minus 1 over R. And Vc, it turns out, you can show, goes like minus. Uh, for one electron? Hmm? This is general. This is in general. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just using the one electron case to argue why it is. Right? Uh, and this alpha n minus 1 uh, is the dipole, uh, is the polarizability. It's polarizability. Of n minus one electrons in the same potential. Uh, okay. Let me just check. N minus one in this case is zero. Yeah. No. This is this is this is this is for one electron. This is for any electrons for any number. I just wanted to put in the one electron there to make the argument that this must go like minus 1 over r. Uh, and in my little picture, you see this is minus 2 over r, and this guy is going like half of it uh, at large r. OK. So that's the end of the lecture bit. Any questions? Yeah. Is alpha in the two black holes the same? 
like the color visibility and uh, why is this critical? No, oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, because it, well, this is this is as an alpha n minus one. So uh, okay. yeah, that's it's totally sure. different. Okay. Totally different. Yeah. Yeah. But people use the same letter for both. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is like uh, perhaps you foresaw to tackle this in another moment in week. But yes. I started, but I didn't see why the, the Yannick's theorem BFP is true just for the homo. But of course, since there are Konshan uh, uh, orbitals, the other orbitals do not have physical meaning. Like, uh, and I never said like why, like why is that? So if you don't have time to do it now, just there is a moment during the week. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we well we have. 15 minutes, right? For, yeah. Wow, we gave us many hours ago. So, so well, well, so the reason that this is only true for the HOMO is because that's the only one that gets isolated in this way, right? You can't. So now, now you, well, you could try to iterate this argument, right? And, and, and then, and then you sort of see what happens. So let's say I start with, uh, with with neon, right? So it's going to be true for the 2p electrons in neon. There's six of them, and this will be exactly true. So then I'll, say, take away those 2p electrons. Uh, but what happens is, of course, my system relaxes. So when I take away those six, the four remaining ones Interact with each other and change. No, right? that absolutely, but yes. that is also in the Hartree-Fock treatment. Uh, so Kuhnman's theorem in, in Hartree-Fock is that this is approximately true if you ignore relaxation, right? So, so the, the difference here is that this is, in this case, exactly true. This is a theorem. Uh, and in a sense, and it would also be approximately true if you ignore relaxation. What actually happens in practice is that each shell, each sort of uh, shell, uh, sort of has this roughly true, but the, but the, there's an error that's different for each shell. But within a shell, it tends to remain roughly correct. Yeah. But it is only exactly true for the last one. Um, Matt has a comment. Yeah. I have a comment. Uh, in, in, in the start of development. Uh, the highest, well, no, the highest occupied. The highest occupied overall energy is minus i, was first stated in the PPL in the paper. Yes. And then there was a question of whether the exchange correlation potential vanishes at infinity, and you could use then the asymptotic decay of the density to say that it vanishes at infinity. So I think there are two parts here. Yes. It, it, whether the, you're assuming that, if you assume that it vanishes at infinity, okay, then you get that. Okay, but you could get I minus, the highest algorithm e equals Minus i, high cycle orbital energy for minus i from the use of the theory of the fraction of the number. Yes. And then use the asymptotic decay to show that the potential goes to zero and infinity. Yes. Yeah. You can run so it both ways. Where around. you assume the event to zero and infinity is not that well, well, I'm just trying to say there's another. Yes. Case. You can yeah. right, do it both ways. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a question. So how did you get to the uh, close form asymptotic expression for the, the correlation energy? Well, uh, that you need to sort of study sort of the exactly sort of the sort of Dyson equation for for these large R behavior. Uh, so it, it's more complicated to pull out the correlation piece. I mean, it's not that hard, but it's... Is there a good reference for that? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, the re a good place to find a good reference is the uh, Omergar and Gomes, um, when is it, 1994 paper for, for the helium, uh, for helium cone champ potential. Now, they weren't the ones who proved that. I think it was uh, 
I'm maybe an old farm bark from somebody else. I'm glad. Thank you. Uh, 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 I'll look on the bar and try to prove that, and the reference is in, is in that paper. Uh, and in fact, Cyrus uh, and Xavier Gans did a sort of heroic calculations on H minus in order to see this behavior. So this is a very, very tiny effect. Because there are even corrections to the exchange that are bigger than that. So it takes a lot of work to pull that guy out. Uh, so another point I want to make that I forgot to make is a crucial, crucial thing that confuses a lot of people is when you solve the Cohen-Sham equations, you take the density and you put it back into your original expression. The energy of your system is not the sum of the Cohn-Shannon orbitals. Uh, and we can even write that, you can write it in terms of the Cohn-Shannon orbitals. So you take the Cohn-Shannon orbital energies and then you can see that there are explicit corrections Um, when you take the sum of the cone sham orbitals, there are corrections that turn it into the many body energy. So a crucial thing to always keep in mind is that when you do one of these fake systems, these one electron type pictures of what is going on, uh, you don't, uh, the energy is not the sum of the cone sham orbitals. However, the cone sham orbitals are so powerful for interpreting what is happening that, I don't know, like in 90% of applied papers, they act as if this were true. And you can also show that in many processes, this number, although it's a finite number, doesn't change much when you go from, say, a molecule to the atoms. And that is why you can often ignore that effect. When the system is strongly correlated, you can't ignore that effect anymore. Uh, that's one of the differences between strong correlation and weak correlation. More questions? Yeah. Uh, you've answered this before, but I didn't fully get the answer. So the on trap system is essentially non -trap. Yes, by so, definition. Yeah. yeah. So the phi, for the mini body phi wave function for the Gonchamp system, uh, then how come it's possible that it's not expressible by a segregator? You answered this, but I didn't get it. So for certain densities, and it, in fact, we even have examples of the densities for uh, for many body problems, the, the lowest energy, so, so one way to put it is, is this. Uh, so if we put together the bits of technology that we have, since this F is equal to this guy, I can write the, the non-interacting kinetic energy, right? If I turn off the interaction here, then all I have is kinetic energy, and it's the minimum overall possible. Um, not well, it's still the minimum overall, sorry, all possible wave functions of, of just the kinetic energy, right? So, so the fact that it's a minimum, this tells you that the TC is always positive because the cone sham kinetic energy minimizes the kinetic energy operator for the given density. Right? But this doesn't say Slater determined. Right? This is over all possible wave functions. So usually that is a single Slater determined, but it doesn't have to be. Um, let me see what's the best way to say it. Four electron 
I don't know what the best way is to say it for the more that time. But if that is psi, is psi doesn't correspond to a non-interacting system. It's just that it's just that we are ignoring the electron electron interaction for an interacting system. No. This is this is the this this definition says nothing about interaction, right? This is the definition of the non-interacting kinetic energy. Yes, but that we, we forget where we got that density from. Doesn't matter where that came from. You give me any density, and this is my definition. Yes. Right? So now the density you happen to give me was one you took from an interacting system, right? Uh, so usually so usually the result of this minimization is a single slater determinant. But there's nothing here that says it must be. Now I think we're going to have some things about density matrices uh, later in the week, and, and this will come up. Why don't you take the example of non-interacting carbon? Right. Some of the density of the eugenic space. I've been avoiding using the word ensemble. <laughs> it's too late, you already did write it down. No, this is, this is, this is you, you can do it in your lecture, this is one, but it's not a good example here. Not one where you're using it to talk about interacting systems. So. No, no, talk about I know, I know, but I'm not going to do it. It's a case where the minimization. There's, there's, not, there's a, a real question about that. And you're free to talk about just, it. Just, just a check. Um, yeah. the, the stuff you've been talking about, the behavior of the chaos potential. Yes. Or the exact density decaying like that. Yes. I assume that's for this specific example. When you do have that, and it wouldn't be valid for saying it's a crystal. You have a so, so this is okay. So the important thing is this is for the, the theorems are generally proven for finite systems, right? So if I have a finite system, I can always go outside. I can go far away, right? Now you can think of a crystal as being very uh, a very big molecule, right? And you can still go outside, and this is all correct. Now there are little bitty things about, uh, you know, if you go along a certain direction, uh, the homo may have no amplitude in that direction, and then there's slight technical complications. But other than that, this is true for any finite system. So when you come, if you want to do a periodic boundary calculation, then you have to check that uh, these things are still true, and you can't prove it in exactly, you know, in, in this way if your calculation is periodic. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not true, right? And this is relevant to what Mel was saying as well. Uh, whether or not you're going to use this condition. If I may add to this last point, in a, period, in a periodic solid, it's a non-question to ask what's the ionization potential because to have an ionization potential, you need to be able to, to take, take it away from the way. infinity. If it's fully periodic, it's just not defined. You need to have at least a surface. That's sort of what I was That's one way to think about it. <laughs> but as, as Mel says, you can you know, start the other way around. There are many ways to. Yeah. OK, then thank you. Thank you for the lecture. Okay.